as an auditor, internal controls, I love them. The first thing that, that I'm gonna do with when I come out to your place is look to see what controls you have in place. And if you don't have any, then we need to start. But if you have some, I would like you guys to go through and test them to make sure that they are working. And I want you to make sure that your staff knows what the rules are, with what your controls are, with what they need to do. With what you should be looking at is your payroll accounts. We've talked about that a lot today. Accounts receivable, accounts payable, and your bank recs. And you guys are thinking, accounts receivable, how does that come up? There are a lot of companies that get paid way too much, and they just stick it in there. And then it just sits there and sits there and sits there. You need to give that money back to whom it is owed to. If not, then after three years, you need to turn it over to us so that we can find them to give them the funds back. So while every state is different when it comes to unclaimed property and unclaimed property law, Idaho is no exception. In 1997, Idaho law allowed for exempt property valued at $50 or less. Idaho is the only state that exempts property valued at $50 or less, and holders can voluntarily report all of the property they're holding. But if not, they must keep it on their records indefinitely because the owner may claim the property at any time. So it can be advantageous for a holder to report the property and get it off their books. However, there is a caveat with this exemption. The owner's last known address must have been in Idaho, and the holder is incorporated or headquartered in Idaho. However, this does not eliminate the obligation of the holder nor the legal liability. As of fiscal year 2012, Idaho changed the 10-year escheat rule. After 10 years of possession, unclaimed property used to a sheet to the state. Currently in Idaho, the only properties that a sheet after 10 years are properties that come to us as unknown or unnamed or without any identifying information. All other property is held in perpetuity forever until the owner or their heirs come forward to claim. A sheet means, I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, but to take ownership in the literal sense. The unclaimed properties that are unknown or unnamed and without any identifying information after 10 years of the first time that those property or funds were received are sheeted into the state of Idaho's general fund. Most states, including Utah and Idaho, only take cons custodial possession. Because a holder must comply with the law of every state that has priority over a particular item of unclaimed property, it is possible that a holder would have to file an unclaimed property report with a large number of states. Because of this, most states' unclaimed property laws are similar, so they've entered into what's called a reciprocity agreement. Under the terms of these reciprocity agreements, property reported and turned over to a state that lacks priority will be forwarded on to the state that does have priority. This right to claim establishes the rule of priority. If the state of last known address is not known for the owner, then the holder's state of incorporation has priority. As an example, say you have an uncashed payroll check from the Home Depot with the owner's address in Utah. The property is reportable to Utah. If the owner's address is unknown, then the property is reportable to Georgia where Home Depot is incorporated. Idaho would prefer that businesses turn these funds over to the state that does have priority. If the funds are turned over to Idaho, the state is not able to indemnify the holder. Idaho does provide a link on our website for ETM, which is Eagle Technology Management. It's a one-stop shop service for reporting to multiple states all on one website. Reciprocity is a benefit that we as the custodian of unclaimed property provide to the holders within Utah, as well as to make it easy for the owners to be reunited with their money. Utah currently forwards property on to all 50 states, including Puerto Rico. This year they performed reciprocity with Puerto Rico and were the first state to perform reciprocity with them. They forwarded Puerto Rico $300 approximately and they were very happy with that. This calendar year, Utah has actually transferred over $1 million to other states, including Puerto Rico, with the exceptions of Washington, D.C., Georgia, and Delaware. Holding periods are generally five years. 
However, some are one year and others can be up to 15 years. Property types. Remember that the only tangible property subject to Utah and Idaho's unclaimed property laws are the contents in safe deposit boxes. If you're sending stuff to Utah that it will eventually go to Idaho, you still have to follow the dormancy periods and any requirements of Idaho. And also, when you send money to another state, you do not, you are not indemnified for that. So there are some downsides to reciprocity. Thank you. So what actions can be taken to prevent abandonment? Owner-initiated activity is any action taken on the part of an owner. So another example, if you can show that the owner initiated a transaction or has more than one account, one of which is active, this would be sufficient proof. You may wish to cross-reference these accounts to avoid reporting the inactive account while the customer is still actively doing business with your organization. Also, correspondence from the customers, such as a signed W-9 form, which is a request for taxpayer identification number and certification, or change of address notification is considered proof of awareness. Lack of owner-initiated activity does start the clock on the dormancy or abandonment period. So as you can see, actions that do not prevent abandonment are automatic drafts, posting of interest, absence of returned mail, or service charges. So in Idaho, charges and reductions to an individual's unclaimed property are limited to those charges created under a binding and valid contract that is regularly enforced by the company or that charge is specifically authorized by a written contract. As we talked about a little bit earlier, earlier Utah does not allow for these except for financial institutions. Finders fees and air finders. I'm sure that you have heard this term before. They're specifically prohibited by law until the unclaimed property has been with the state of Utah and Idaho for two years. This is a title that some in the profession choose to utilize as a title. They charge a fee for their service, and we at the state of Utah and Idaho unclaimed property perform these services for free. Record retention. So in Idaho, records must be retained for seven years plus the dormancy period, and it begins the year after the presumption of abandonment. In Utah, the records must be maintained for 10 years, plus the dormancy period, and it also begins the year after the presumption of abandonment. Okay, your first question is gonna be, what brings me out to your place? What brings on an audit? Well, if you're not reporting, that's a good one. <laughs> it, will, it will raise a red flag. What I have found out on audits is that most people, most businesses, do not know what they are doing, that they need training. Most of them want to do what's right, and as soon as they are trained, they do with what's right and things run smoothly. Very rarely have we ever found where someone is really trying to do things wrong or commit fraud. Uh, if property is omitted, that will raise a red flag to me. Uh, if a company merges or reorgs, then that is a red flag because there, there are records that are usually lost. We have found that in the past. It's a common occurrence. Industry. We are finding out that industries, that there are some that are better than others based on their, their own knowledge. And the ones that are weak are the ones that, are, that will get us out to their place. Yes, sir. And then I have a question. Maybe, Audrey, you can answer this. Say, for example, we have a branch that's located in Idaho. So common sense tells us that the customer opened the account in Idaho, but we have a bad address for them, or we went through an acquisition where we took them on knowing that there was a bad address. We have no record mm -hmm. of the customer's last known address. Mm -hmm. But because we're incorporated in Utah, do we have to report it to Utah? Or common sense, do we report it to Idaho because we know that that's where they were located? It depends on whether it's intangible property or tangible property. If it's contents in the safe deposit box um, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is Texas versus New Jersey of 1965, physical property always goes to the at place. So if you have contents in a safe deposit box and it's in Idaho, it's going to go to Idaho even if you have an address for that owner in Utah. If, um, if you do not know the address of someone and you reasonably suspect they opened it in Idaho, 
and you're incorporated in Utah and it's intangible property, the appropriate protocol would be to send that to Utah. Now there have been instances where I have um, worked with people at states and for instance it might be um, United Way, uh, the Greater Salt Lake City, Utah, but I am incorporated in New York. You know, in instances like that where you're concerned, number one, you can do extensive re outreach and find that person and reunite the funds before it gets turned over. And sometimes it's really appropriate to go ahead and reach out to the state and say, I have a little bit of a dilemma with this one. Um, you're always going to want to look at the cost benefit analysis on that. If it's a $75 check, you're not going to want to invest the resources as if it's a $75,000 check. But every now and again, you will get a state to say, why don't you return it to the state that they're most likely to look for it? And I've had that instance when I was dealing with a broker-dealer account. You have somebody, you have the state of residence, you have the state where they're getting their statements, and you can really have several different addresses, and so it can get really confusing as which one to send it to. And in those instances, states are very helpful. I, I will add one little caveat. When you call a state, please give them some context. If you ask a yes or no question, they can give you a yes or no answer, but they might not understand what you're trying to get at. So if you give them a little scenario and some context to shape their answer, then it's, you're gonna get better responses. 